You need more than just talent to become a star in the entertainment industry. You also need a strong support team, and that includes a great publicist. Richard Flohill is one of Canada's very best. Richard was born and raised in England, which is where he developed a love for blues and jazz. I was at a terrible English boarding school. The only advantage of that was that there were girls in the school. It was one of the few private schools, which they call public schools, only the Brits, um, that had girls in it. Wonderful invention. Um, sport just struck me as a huge waste of time and energy. But I was good at long distance running because the faster you were around, the quicker you were in and out of the shower before the rest of the sh lot arrived. And I could get to listen to the BBC Jazz Club, 4.15 Wednesday afternoons. And that got me into jazz. And from then it was sort of game over. There weren't a lot of jazz musicians in Britain. So in the spring of 1957, 18 year old Richard packed up his old life and began a new one in Canada. I just left because I needed to get out. And also, I was now an entrenched blues fan. And I wanted to go to the States, but they wanted to know whether my grandmother was a communist and how did I know? And I went to the Canadian consulate and said, you know, can I emigrate to Canada? And they said, do you have a passport? And I said, I did. They said, could you do a medical? Is your heart okay? And I was here within three months. And uh, Toronto was, without question, the most boring city in history. It was awful, but it always had a good music scene. On my first day in Canada, I walked down Young Street and I saw a sign outside a bar and it said, all this week, Earl Hines and the All Stars. I went, Earl Hines, holy. So I went in, talked to a bartender who was polishing the counter because it was in the afternoon. I said, Earl Hines is here. He said, yeah. I said, Earl Hines who played with Louis Armstrong in the 20s and had a big band in the 40s. Yeah. I said, how much is it to get in? He said, it's free, but you have to buy two beers. I thought this could well be the promised land. Although his first love was jazz and blues, Richard soon discovered several Canadian rock bands that caught his ear. The R&B scene was very kind of loosey-goosey and often involved in kind of somewhat shady circumstances. Canadian bands came about listening to that. During the 60s, they would start to pick up on the American artists that just sort of wandered in and out of town all the time. I swear Bo Diddley used to live at the cock door. Ronnie Hawkins had his place. There were the Friars, there was the Brown Derby. There were all these places. Canadian bands initially in the early 60s were very, very imitative. But one or two of them really got the sense of it. Of the pop bands from that era that I remember with affection, Kensington Market, Luke and the Apostles, Grant Smith and the Power, The Paupers with Adam Mitchell and Chuck Beale. And I was lucky enough when the Yorkville scene began to come you know, in the early 60s um, through. Uh, I remember sitting in the, in the Penny Farthing with Skip Prokop and Paul Hoffert while they were planning Lighthouse, that we would have this rock band with horns and a string section. Richard witnessed the growing Canadian music scene of the 1960s with great enthusiasm and saw many of Canada's soon-to-be greats just as they were getting good. Watching Joni Mitchell on stage at the riverboat, endlessly tuning her guitar. Bernie Fiedler, the owner, had made a deal with the Greyhound Bus Company that as part of your ticket of your tour to Toronto, you got to see real hippies in a real folk club. And Joni's on stage, tuning, endlessly twingling away. 
It's a big hubbub at the front. Bernie runs from the back kitchen right in front and, and shepherds a busload of American tourists in the front door, across through, opened the back door and out they went. And Tony's going, huh, what happened? It was insane. But Bernie probably got five bucks a ticket out of. Flo Hill began writing for various trade publications while continuing to book American blues artists into Toronto clubs. And within three months, I was the assistant editor of a magazine called Electrical Contracting and Maintenance in Canada. Then I became editor of Canadian Woodworker. Then I did something called Furniture and Furnishings Daily. That, you know, whatever. And in the middle of all this, we're in the mid 60s, I was kind of on the side bringing American blues singers into Toronto. I'd been to Chicago, I had met Muddy Waters. Howling Wolf, Buddy Guy. So I began to get a reputation as a blues expert. I knew very, very little about it. The supposed expertise got me involved in 1965 in something called the Mariposa Folk Festival. I had no idea what that was. At that festival that weekend, I heard and met Ian and Sylvia, Gord Lightfoot, Leonard Cohen, Buffy St. Marie, Phil Oakes, Staple Singers, and on and on and on. And that quite literally changed my life, which is why I get evangelical about the value of folk festivals. It's the F word. It carries the image of young women with Birkenstocks and loose dresses doing helicopter dancing by the side of the stage. And yes, God bless them, there are still there, but that is not what this is about. So I would go to four or five or six festivals every year and have done since 1965. I'm hooked. The annual Mariposa Folk Festival quickly became an important part of Richard's life. I was its artistic director for five years in the late 80s and early 90s. It pissed with rain during four of the five years I had the job. You imagine and God laughs. One of Richard's many strengths is his ability to spot new talent. I'm pretty good at spotting the new kids on the block, the, the young ones that are happening. And to do that, I spend four or five nights a week wandering around in clubs managing successfully not to drink myself to a smudge, and along the way you find wonderful people. Richard Flohill has spent the majority of his adult life writing about and working with Canadian musicians, and it all started with the band Rush. I got a freelance assignment for a magazine that no longer exists. It was called The Canadian, and it ran with the daily paper on Saturdays right across the country. And they paid me $1,000 and my expenses to do an on-the-road-with-rush story. So I did, um, and I guess this was about 75. The band had broken, and I joined the band in Albuquerque, and I wrote the story. With all the varied things Richard has done in his career, it's somewhat hard to pin him down on what he actually does. I used to say I was a writer, and then I came to Canada and became a, an editor, and then I became a publicist, and one of my clients calls me her gatekeeper. Um, I don't know what it is I do. One of the problems is that a lot of the stuff you do comes as a result of a long experience, a long time in the trenches. Somebody said, well, you know everybody. I said, no, I don't. But if I didn't know an awful lot of people, I'd have wasted the last 45 years. For nearly half a century, Richard Flohill has been an important, influential figure on the Canadian music scene, with a mantle full of awards and accolades. 
But now that he's in his 70s, he knows he can't go on forever. If I keep busy enough, the Grim Reaper won't catch me. I certainly feel there's tons of stuff I haven't done. There's lots of great music I haven't heard yet. There are wonderful people to meet that I haven't. John Lee Hooker said, it's too late to stop now. So I go on.